Welcome to Stanford Legal, where we look at the cases, questions, conflicts, and stories that affect us all every day. I'm Pam Carlin, along with Joe Bankman. Hi, Joe. Hi, Pam. Pam, a while ago, we had our colleague Michelle Anderson on this show, and she talked about what what's it like to be in a city that goes bankrupt, to be in a Detroit, a Vallejo, or a Stockton. Yeah, and today we're actually going to ask a question that might seem at one point at like it's the opposite, but actually has some disturbing commonalities, and that's what happens to a city that succeeds beyond its wildest dreams. That's right. And today we're going to be guided in that question and maybe get some answers by one of our grads, Carrie, Carrie McClellan. Uh, excuse me, Carrie. Oh, Carrie too was too a, uh, a 15 grad of the law school, but before that he was a documentary filmmaker uh, he made a film without shepherds, which looks at the life of six uh, six people from Pakistan as they negotiate their world. He came to law school, and among other things, after law school, he's written a terrific book, Silicon City, San Francisco in the Long Shadow of the Valley. Welcome, Kerry. Thanks so much, Joe. It's so great to have you here. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what inspired you to write this book? Yeah, I uh, came back from about a 10-year career, as you guys mentioned, in uh, human rights work. And a lot of the work I I did was in places of conflict, places around the world, where there were real, not just sort of physical rights questions, but economic rights questions. And came back, moved to downtown San Francisco, uh, met my wife, we settled down, and felt we, that we were in the middle of a very similar story, unfortunately, that uh, here in America... It's not just the homelessness crisis, which I think is is unique in San Francisco and parts of California and parts of the West Coast to, to the rest of the country, where it's just obviously a human rights um, abuse happening daily, and the UN has recognized it as such. But I think then you sort of expand wider and you think about how people are, are finding sort of housing, uh, economic stability, workplace stability, and all of that's been transformed very rapidly, in part because of... Uh, macroeconomic dynamics that San Francisco has been a particular beneficiary of, in part because the technology itself that's made arguments about relationships between workers uh, and their employers, about uh, uh, online marketplaces that have transformed the way people guide their careers, um, and have really accelerated some of the beneficiaries and some of the um, uh, the sort of winners and losers dynamics of what's happening in the Bay Area. And Carrie, this is a different kind of book because our audience is probably thinking, we know the kind of books these guys write. Going to have lots of footnotes, going to have lots of expert opinion, kind of talking heads in print. Yeah. That's not what your book is. It echoes back to the great chronicler of Chicago, Studs Terkel. What you have is interviews of ordinary people in the city. Exactly. I mean, I, I, it's very kind of you to mention Studs in, in the context of any interview about this book because it's a huge hero. But what I felt like I had value to add to the conversation was an ability as a storyteller and as a documentarian to be able to listen to other people's stories, to be able to surface the important ones and make visible or audible in this case or, or legible um, experiences that weren't um, at center stage while we were trying to figure out what was happening inside the city. So the, the journalism for this, the book began while I was at law school. And it began, actually, you mentioned um, Michelle, but she was a, her class, Cities in Distress, which has become a huge inspiration for um, her subsequent work, was also for me, living in San Francisco, the question I explored with her was what happens when uh, two strong cities where the inequality itself, though some are benefiting, becomes perniciously acute for those who can't hold on. Um, and, and when you said the book was you wanted to make things visible and audible as well as legible, that was, for me, one of the most striking things about the book was you could really see these people talking. You mm. could hear their voices. And, you know, when we were talking before the show, we talked about, like, well, which was our favorite mm. or which was the mm. part of the book that most grabbed us. And I think Joe and I individually said the one that grabbed us most was the longshoreman. So can you tell us a little bit about his story and then read us a passage from Yeah, the that's book. kind. I, I, his name's Lyman Hollins, and he's um, still in Berkeley today. And a lot of his perspective was looking at um, a place that had become for, for uh, his father and for him sort of the center of his family's um, external life, public life, and, and living, which was the, the shipyards uh, in downtown San Francisco. He has a great quote at the beginning, which I'm, I, I'm not going to read too much of, but 
uh, where he opens, he says, I was texting a friend to say, trying to say gentrifying neighborhood, and the spell check on my phone corrected it to say terrifying neighborhood, which is, I think, an experience um, like many longtime San Franciscans are going through. Um, a lot of what he talks about is he inherited his father's union card. He inherited his father's book. He inherited literally his father's overalls and was wearing – he was Lyman Holland's junior and his father was Lyman Holland. So he's wearing um, his father's name as he goes about doing his work. Um, and a lot of what his story is is being able to sort of see not just his father work through the peak of shipping in San Francisco but also sort of watch it, it dwindling uh, to, to a sort of disappearing craft in the city. And at the end, I'm just going to read the last portion, which is – him evoking what it felt like um, to do the work, um, why he why he committed. He had a graduate degree himself, but committed to this work nonetheless. And he begins by describing some of the people who were there. And he goes, there was a huge variety of people on the waterfront. There were people who had law degrees who still were putting in a few hours a month as a longshoreman to maintain benefits and things. People who were architects, retired, trained engineers. More women started coming down, coming from other jobs and bringing those experiences there's nothing like three o'clock in the morning on a container ship, breaking loose a few bays of cargo, removing all those heavy iron rods, sweaty, greasy, hanging out with a bunch of men of different ages, black men talking about life, not competing for money, not competing for a different position, just bullshitting, politics, love, life, school, friends, your family, the white man, all those things, but in this amazing, sometimes bizarre setting especially when you're out on those terminals closest to the end of 7th Street and you have this amazing view of San Francisco and the Bay Bridge and the lights and you're sitting up there high thinking, wow, it just doesn't get better than this. They're paying me for this, to be here with these people in this moment. Yes, it's true. It's 3 o'clock in the morning. I'm freezing. I'm wet from sweat, but I am not stuck in an office someplace. I'm not programming right now. I'm in communion and community with people. And that's really, in some sense, the message of the book is the loss of that idea of community, of face-to-face -face contact, of contact over the generations and the like. Yeah. I mean, my family has some of that story in it as well. And my um, grandparents both had moved to San Francisco as uh, Jews in the Midwest who couldn't find another place in the country that was possible for them. My parents met and started their family here. Then I met my wife here. And so there's a degree to which, very personally, this is a place of family and community. Then you look back at the history, particularly sort of the post-50s, post-World War II history in America, and you see um, uh, not just sort of the free speech movement and the uh, birth of the LGBTQ movement that came out of here, recognizing, but you have an important Latino working rights movement. You have the black middle class, which importantly was able to sort of get a very strong foothold here. And that idea of particularly Northern California as a place that that not without struggle, but was uh, made it possible for these important cultural moments in, in the country to be seen here, um, felt like it was being eroded as the jobs in technology continued to go towards people from outside the city who were predominantly white and male. This is Stanford Legal. And today we're talking with Kerry McClelland about his book, Silicon City. Joe? Tell us about the one community that uh, uh, Mr. Hollins belongs. So this is a kind of black, African-American, middle-class community. What's become of them in San Francisco now? Well, I think the statistic is that, you, that you've gone from, at its peak, uh, a San Francisco that had, had 15 to 16 percent of the population as African-American, and then today there's less than 3 percent. So that's just— that's and, an, and where have they gone? Um, any number of places throughout um, California and the U.S., but but we are traditionally seeing, in terms of displacement, those the the people who are having to leave because of either they're being priced out or or officially evicted from their homes. That's predominantly people of color. That's predominantly working people, and predominantly the elderly. And they can't find homes because of the price crisis, because of how the affordability crisis in homes throughout the city. It's not just even Oakland across the bay or even Antioch. Um, or Pittsburgh, which were once upon a time places that, that people could go. You, you're, you're seeing families move as far as Stockton now to find a place where they can live and afford a home. Um, the 
trouble, of course, with Stockton is there isn't the same job base or economy there. And so you're seeing more and more families, of course, living in cars in San Francisco. So there's a sort of, whether it's the, the black community or whether it's the Latino community or whether it's any number of communities that are being forced out of San Francisco during this time, you're watching generations kind of get torn apart as some people are able to hold on and some people aren't. And that means the the political fabric of the community is also weakening. And one of the things that was striking to me is the same thing is actually happening at the other end. So you have an interview in the book with another Stanford alum, Mac Gonzalez, and he's talking about how there are all of these tech workers who work in Silicon Valley, and that's where the generation of the money and the tax bases. And then they go back to San Francisco and they're not really part of the city. And they're not really part of the valley either because when they're down here, they're on their campus 24-7 living like undergrads into their 40s. Yeah, I think there's there's a dynamic that the book captures, which makes me empathize sort of across economic strata with the exception of at the very 1%. Where I, I think if you're a family of two, both of whom are working in a, a professional job or in tech and who are uh, commuting down to a campus uh, a couple hours every day and are trying to keep an eye on your kids and trying to figure out how to get them into the right schools and all those things, those economic pressures are also suffocating. Um, and they're not. that's not to create a false equivalence between that and a family that's become evicted or living on the street in any respect. But it means that where is the civic space for anybody to be putting the energy back into what is their local community and neighborhood? Where, where, where is that space? If it's not in the upper middle class and it's not in the middle class and it's certainly not in the working class anymore in the Bay Area, who is knitting the community back together? And I, I might note that even if you happen to be a tech worker and work in the city – say at Twitter, you don't eat in the city anymore. Your company now supplies everything you need. So you don't have to go out to a local restaurant if you don't want to. Or, or you eat at a place that certainly doesn't make it possible for other people to be there in quite the yeah. same way. Like the restaurants for many people um, who have the money to spend. I mean, you're, you're just finding a lot of sort of like affluence and keeping up with the, the the Joneses, keeping people at restaurants that are quite expensive, having them take take use transit options that are more expensive. And it's eroded the public infrastructure and the kind of neighborhood restaurants and neighborhood shops that would have been there for um, people who otherwise had called that home for a long period of time. One of the most stri- One of the most striking things for me in the book is when you juxtapose some of the sections that are far apart you know, page-wise, but are people who are similar in ways. And the most striking one for me in a book that I found myself constantly hitting the little button to mark this passage because I wanted to come back to it is the story of two different taxi drivers, two different drivers in San Francisco. I wondered if you might tell us a little bit about that because it was such a dramatic example of everything I think that the book is about. Yeah, I think the book at its best is is told in parables. So it's people speaking in their bone voice, it's monologues. But um, the cab driver in the book isn't just somebody who worked at a cab for 40 years. That's true. He also represented cab drivers in the taxi commission. This is Stanford Legal, and today we're talking with Kerry McClelland about his book, Silicon Valley. You're about to tell us about these taxi drivers. Right. And so Paul Paul is somebody who, um, after the Kyoto Accords, were, were sort of disregarded by the, the Bush administration and not ratified. San Francisco did the most San Francisco thing, which was to pass an ordinance saying that it was going to um, outstrip the Bush administration, uh, but outstrip the Kyoto Accords and double um, the goals there by cutting uh, the city's emissions by 20 percent. Paul made that possible by essentially writing and passing a law that converted the taxi fleet to hybrids, essentially accomplishing for the whole city what um, no other sector was able to do. He's still riding a cab. He was at the time still driving a cab in San Francisco. And within about a year of that accomplishment, Uber X was was um, innovated and Lyft launched. And those two dropped tens of thousands of cars onto San Francisco alone, let alone the Bay Area. Not alone, not just raising emissions, but those few of those cars, there, there's certainly no hybrid standard for those cars. Um, and uh, traffic has gotten worse, keeping cars on the road, driving longer. So there's a number of ways in which th- that his major accomplishment is undone. And then his livelihood as well is also undone. Paul, Paul as a new development since the book was published, has had to leave San Francisco and has moved back to the Midwest because he can't make a living as a cab driver anymore. Flip that by, by juxtaposition. 
one of the one of the first Uber drivers is also in the book. Um, he's somebody who drove um, uh, Travis Kalanick and any number of um, uh, uh, tech founders around San Francisco when Uber was first a limousine company. And his story is also something of a parable. I mean, he came to the country as a computer science student from the Congo. Um, that degree didn't get him to where he had hoped it would, uh, having dreams of joining the tech industry here. Um, instead, he found himself as a driver for Uber. Uh, and I, th I think stepping back, he's very good at not just sort of giving us a perspective of what Uber, a, a day in the life of an Uber driver feels like, being peppered by, with questions from passengers who, who consider him something of a fascination. But also there's this, this, this perspective he has where all the things, the corruption, um, the rat race, the inability to give um, his family health care, the inability to give his kids an education, all the things he thought he was leaving the Congo for, he's found back here in America and particularly in California and the Bay Area. And so he, you know, there's a quote of his that I'll, I'll, I'll massacre right now, but it's something like, I left the Congo to avoid all these things and now I found them here. And so there are these sort of – there are these ways in which there's just no one winning. It's not, it's not the cab drivers. It's not the Uber drivers. Uh, there's possibly a number of founders who are winning. But it's hard to talk about them as being representative of anything like an economic miracle here. You know, one of the things that we started talking about is Michelle Anderson's story of Stockton. And I mm -hmm. can't help but note how the stories intersect in one way, and that's curtail of families that live in Stockton. And these could be families that lost their home in San Francisco as a rising rents, but now are working where they can get jobs in San Francisco. And what she focuses on are the kids. Mm -hmm. So their parents are working. 10 hour days, eight hour, and then they have to commute three, mm -hmm. four hours. So these are kids that really are being raised without the family because the family is, they might be migrant workers in a third world country working in a mine in a distant county. Yeah, the book touches upon that, I yeah. think, in a couple of ways. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think um, there's a school teacher in the book who speaks to some of those things of seeing in her students the fact that parents were either working so hard or commuting so far that they weren't able to um, be present and, and really raise their children, particularly support their education. But there's also a, a, a community leader in the book from Stockton who talks about receiving these families from Oakland and San Francisco and, and recognizing that they, they're, they're entering a totally different culture. The Central Valley is completely different and it has um, – different economic dynamics, different racial and ethnic dynamics, and, and particularly um, uh, watching the families that are trying to sort out how to keep a toehold in, in whatever economic opportunity there is for them still in their jobs in San Francisco and Oakland, while also having a family um, still remain in Stockton. Instead, most families, not most, I should say, but many, many families and more families each year are choosing to live in cars in the South Bay or, or San Francisco, which is becoming a, a rising proportion of the homeless population. We'll be back with more from our guest, Kerry McClellan, talking about his book, Silicon City, and where we find ourselves in the Bay Area, next on Stanford Legal, here on Sirius XM Insight 121. Welcome back to Stanford Legal, where we look at the cases, questions, conflicts, and legal stories that affect us all every day. I'm Pam Carlin, along with Joe Bankman. And today we're talking with Kerry McClelland about his book, Silicon City. Joe? Kerry, before our break, we talked about the displacement uh, in the city and the problems it was causing. Your book has some heroes in it as mm -hmm. well, or heroes to me when I read it. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about them. Yeah, I think one of the, the major lessons in the book is that the people who are making the biggest impact in the community are those who have some sort of um, storytelling and relational insight themselves. And I think Tony Sagrado is is a good example of this. Um, but Tony is also another one of these parables. You know, Tony is a 10-year a juvenile justice advocate. He's essentially a social worker who works with uh, young kids who get caught in the criminal justice system, stands up with them next to them in court. Um, tells uh, the judge before trial that he can monitor them in their community, look after them with their family, make sure they're going to school, and hopefully by the time uh, the process arrives at sentencing, be able to demonstrate a good track record and, and keep the kids in their home and keep them out of prison for, for good. 
And he's got exceptional insight into that. Part of that is just sort of getting deep into his kids' lives and really sort of empathizing with them and understanding them. And one uh, young girl who um, was on a her, her, her uh, had multiple um, violations had uh, he he just recognized that she had a learning disability. The learning disability had kept her out of school. Being in the street meant that she had eventually committed a crime, and that meant that she was in front of him at that point. They just fixed the classes she was in, put her in the right programs in school, and she thrived. Um, so I think Tony's th- – that that kind of interpersonal insight and that insight that's built out of knowing a community over 10 years is something that just can't be replaced by him disappearing. Of course, Tony's story has a sort of like a coda to it, which is – that his daughter gets very sick. Um, he works on a nonprofit salary. Uh, his insurance can't cover the e- extreme cost of her care. And uh, he has to take a second job. And his second job is to be a guard in juvenile prisons at night. So by day, he's keeping them out of prison. And at night, he's literally shutting the doors in their face. Um, and that's, I think, the paradox that we're in right now is we keep we have, the as a community, um, the ingredients and talent we need to be able to move forward. Uh, I, I could name any number of people in the book. Rob Gittin, who uh, worked with homeless youth. And again, he just walked the streets every night until he got to know the homeless youth in the neighborhoods of the Tenderloin and the Mission and knew all of whom they were and was able to be there as a counselor and service provider for them when they needed it. Um, he built an organization that did that work as well. Um, Maria Guerrero, who... Um, was a labor activist and helped helped uh, Intel service workers um, unionize. Uh, she did so by showing up in their homes and learning their stories and understanding what mattered to them. Even Saad Khan, who's a venture capitalist in the book, who invests in essentially purpose-driven techno- technology and progr- with a somewhat progressive bent, even Saad's goal is to sit down with founders, understand what they're doing, understand what matters to them, and understand what really drives their businesses before he's even going to think about putting money into them. And that it to me that 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 makes me feel like it, at, in an era where you know Facebook and many tech companies argument is we can sort of like atomize a lot of these relationships into the ether and sort of move our community online and move a lot of these congr- contractual relationships into the past that that the people who know how to move through community from person to person are really the people who are holding it together and necessary but hopefully unlike unlike what's happening to Tony, we're able to, in this moment, shift our attention back to those values and preserve a lot of what made San Francisco so special in the first place. You know, what I got out of the book, and this is for other people that might be considering reading it, is just how human and compelling these stories is. I mean, it's one thing to to, to describe it. But when Tony says, I'm embarrassed to tell people how little I make, Mm -hmm. but then he has to be embarrassed to tell the people on the left, the PD, that he's working as a guard, that really humanizes the parable, the struggle we're in. Or when uh, uh, Rob Gittin talks about taking, taking someone out to lunch, a young woman, just so that she can say the vilest things to him, F you, F you, F you, metaphorically, until it's out of her system. This is Stanford Legal, and today we're talking with Kerry McClelland about his book, Silicon City. Joe? Uh, so we have, these, we have these, these heroes, and what you show us as a reader is just how, I was thinking how hard it is to do it and what a unique skill they have. Did, did you feel that as you talked to them, or do you have that same skill maybe? I have a, I have a hard time... Um, uh, being as categorical, and I don't feel yeah. like this is what your intention is, but to call some people heroes, heroes. in the book and some okay. otherwise. And it's not because I reject the term, but it's because I feel like some of what the book's trying to accomplish is our ability to sort of recognize that capacity in everyone. There's there's a tremendous amount of wisdom you hear from sort of everybody in the book yeah. um, from their particular point of view. And it, and it extends from, I think, Venture capitalists in the book who are who are some of the primary beneficiaries of what's going on here, people who are knee deep in technology and people outside of it, of course. And so I some of what San Francisco offers the opportunity to to do as a sort of like hithor, historical and and part of its mythology is the sort of go west young man ability to come to a new place and redefine yourself and determine what your purpose is and establish yourself in a new community as as something self propelled and when i hear that your 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 
what you identify as heroism is somebody being able to, for a brief moment, be able to sort of fulfill that purpose. Um, and everybody in this book and everybody, frankly, that I interviewed recognized the problems in their community and wanted to do something about it. And there are just a handful of people who are able to sort of find that narrow gap to being able to be funded enough to do it, to be able to sort of get enough momentum behind the work, to be able to summon the courage, to be able to fight through the obstacles. And those who either get knocked back or knocked down or those who um, – uh, trip accidentally or find something along the way. That's just part of life. But everybody, it's a beautiful thing about, I think, this region is that everybody is trying to orient themselves towards something better on the other end, finding momentum and consensus and common ground around it. Um, so there's some some heroes in everyone in the book. And what we see is some people are able to realize mm -hmm. that that acting according to their values. And the rest of us are are searching for ways to do it, maybe. Yeah, I find I find there, there's a woman in the book who, um, as the Bay Bridge, some people who may be listening may or may, or may not know this, but the Bay Bridge was for, um, you know, a very long time, I, I will get the dates wrong, one structure that had, for the first time, connected basically the Western coach to the country to the rest of the interstate highway system. And over the last, over over the period of time I was writing the book, that structure got dismantled, essentially, and replaced with something very new and shiny and lovely in its own right. But this old icon of uh, a Bay Area that was finally connecting the whole country to its Western furthest coast, um, was getting dis dismantled, much of it sold for scrap metal, must have, much of it going for, to China. And there's a woman in the book who preserves a lot of that metal, begins to send it to artists around the country, and is beginning to build a structure that, that goes around the bay as a public artwork. It, there's different levels of heroism in everybody, but Karen Cusolito, who's the woman who, who's accomplishing that, I think is no less heroic than, than, and visionary than anybody else in the book, just because that, that, that symbolic act is, is certainly not interacting with the sort of day-to-day -day li livelihood struggle. So you started writing the book out of a sense of pessimism about where the Bay Area was. And yet, when you talk about it, you exude a kind of optimism about people trying to figure things out. I mean, are you optimistic, more optimistic after writing the book than before? Are you more pessimistic or about the same? I think I get exhausted by the inaction in the Bay Area politically. And so there's a there's a disheartening pattern of new people coming into politics and being incapable of passing affordable housing bills, um, being capable of at best uh, creating parking lots that that uh, harbor the families in their cars but but can't put them in an affordable home. But the work of doing this book reminds me that like there is there is no lack of will towards trying to figure this out. And the fact that we just don't have the leadership today that can really congeal that, that we've defunded the public sector and that we're unwilling to rip resources out of the hands that have benefited from it most, I think is is we have to work through the path to getting to there so that we can actually build the society that we clearly in this book all want to see. We've been talking today with Kerry McClellan, author of Silicon City, San Francisco in the Long Shadow of the Valley. And Kerry, we've only really begun to mm. uh, uh, to cover some of the some of your insights and some of the really interesting and I take it all heroic people, <laughs> uh, and that includes all of us in the book. Uh, we hope you'll come back for your uh, next work as well. Hi. So thank you for joining us on Stanford Legal here on Sirius XM Insight 121.